And they ran a story by somebody named Chauncey DeVega. Quote, I find black garbage pail kids, black conservatives, fascinating. That's just unbelievable. You know, it's- he goes by the name of Chauncey DeVega. You know, I've been called Uncle Tom, Oreo, Oreo sellout, shameless. But this is a new one. Well, let's talk now to Chauncey DeVega. As my man Chauncey DeVega of the blog We Are Respectable Negroes says, I have author and blogger Chauncey DeVega here with us. Hello, and welcome to the Chauncey DeVega Show. You may recognize my voice from Ring of Fire Radio with Mike Papantonio, the BBC, Tom Hartman, the Ed Schultz Radio Show, or Our Common Grounds with Janice Graham. We had the great opportunity to sit back and talk with Mr. Bill the Lizard, friend of the website, lifelong uh, heterosexual life partner, as I jokingly refer to him as, in the Kevin Smith sense of the word about all things Star Wars Episode Seven. That was our first episode. It was really a nice way of relaunching, so to speak, with our new format here. Obviously, we got the upgraded audio. You can find the show on our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube, type in Chauncey DeVega, it'll come up. It's always nice to reach back, especially given all the conversation and excitement around the new Star Wars movie, right? Star Wars Episode Seven, now known as The Force Awakens. So it was great to sit down for the first episode of Season 3 and talk to a dear friend about all things Star Wars related. The next two episodes of Season 3 here on the Chauncey DeVega Show are going to be about some very serious business. Um, I have written extensively about police brutality, the militarization of the police, the killings of Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, and so many others. And I had the opportunity to chat with two folks who have been on the ground in Ferguson. One is our first conversation partner, Mr. Lou Dubois. Lou is just a great resource. He is the editor and one of the lead writers for the great independent newspaper known as the Washington Spectator. Uh, Lou has a lot of credentials, a lot of experience in journalism. He's old-fashioned journalist, asks hard questions, who, what, when, how, and why, as I used to teach in journalism school. So Lou gives you the steak and the sizzle, as we like to say. And he's appeared on 60 Minutes. He's been interviewed by the BBC, um, magazines such as The Nation. And it was just really great to be able to reach out to him because I knew he was on the ground in Ferguson. He showed up towards the very end of the riots and the protests against the police. And as I've said with Michael Papantonio in Ring of Fire, that the riots, quote-unquote, in Ferguson, this is a critical, critical point, were not riots by African Americans, brown folks, and our white allies. We were not rioting. We'll talk about that racial framing and how the media, when discussing citizen activism and discussing how black and brown folks, when we have been so aggrieved, so violated in terms of our citizenship rights, that somehow when we protest, it's a riot. When in fact, what happened in Ferguson was a riot, in the classic sense of the word, by the police against the people of Ferguson. So in part one, Lou Bois and I sat down. We talked about his experiences on the ground in Ferguson, his impressions of the community and its dynamics, his predictions for what may or may not imminently happen, because actually as I'm preparing to post a podcast on chancydebega.com, it is a Wednesday, this is going to go up on Thursday, and rumors are afoot, of course, that the decision by the grand jury is imminent. The midterm elections have passed. The governor has gone on TV basically intimidating the people of Ferguson, saying they will tolerate no violence against property, basically daring people to continue with their protests and pushing people to react to what we know is going to be an imminent decision um, based on all of the leaks, based on the corruption of the Ferguson Police Department, based on the corruption and malpractice of the prosecutor to let Darren Wilson uh, walk free. There'll be a no bill in the technical terms about his decision or in the series of decisions that led to him, and this is my opinion, don't sue me, to execute uh, Michael Brown. Because based on everything the witnesses have said, and as I've said repeatedly on We Are Respectable Negroes, Alternate and Salon and elsewhere, on Twitter, certainly participating in that conversation, I don't know of any person, a person of color especially, with six witnesses who basically give the same story about you committing manslaughter an unnecessary uh, murder in the extreme against an unarmed person who surrendered and you would be walking on the street. Simply doesn't happen. But you put on the blue and you happen to be white, well, it's a license to kill black and brown people. So Lou Du Bois talk about that and other issues. The second episode of the podcast will be next week. Right? We're dropping these every Thursday for the foreseeable future with Pastor Renita Lampkin. You've also seen her on the Huffington Post. She's been quoted by Al Jazeera. She's been getting a lot of attention this week and last regarding her on-the-ground activism so we have a nice one-two punch here. We got Luda Bois, who's on the ground as a journalist in Ferguson, given his perspective as an outsider. Then the following episode, next Thursday, 
is from Pastor Renita. She'll be offering her perspective as someone who's on the ground, as a member of the community, as someone who's involved in outreach, who mates her religious and spiritual commitments as a pastor with her commitment to helping young people in particular and all folks in Ferguson. So, I mean, it's going to be a very powerful and very, very relevant conversation here on the Chauncey DeVega Show. I do hope you enjoy it. On behalf of the website ChaunceyDeVega.com and the podcast series now known as the Chauncey DeVega Show, I just want to thank you for joining us to talk about Ferguson. We've had a ton of coverage about the horrible events in Ferguson with Daryl Wilson's shooting of Michael Brown. The jury, of course, is still out. We have the grand jury. And I wanted to reach out to you because you wrote a series of what I think are very insightful and smart pieces about this, the vibe and the tone and the energy in Ferguson. So what was it like actually going to Ferguson? And what was your barometer for the feelings and sentiments and energy of the people you met there? Well, the odd thing was uh, I got there as the, the most of the violence was kind of tapering down the last night of real violence. And when, when, when the governor brought in Ron Johnson, a, an African-American uh, state trooper, to, who really changed the entire dynamic of police public relations. The guy was a mensch. He has his critics, but, you know, I, I, ran, I, I ran into him walking walking and on a Saturday walking in and the NAACP youth march in the march you know sweating out his blues 98 degrees 98 degree humidity so that changed it here's a weird thing to me i arrived there late for the story and I found a dry, a fluorescent drive exit on the freeway as I was heading out of St. Louis. So I turned, but it was the wrong fluorescent drive. And you drive in there and there are brew, brew pubs and, you know, these, these little trendy little boutique restaurants. And you say, ah, this ain't it. That ain't it. You drive another another exit and you're on the correct fluorescent avenue. And, and then, you know, you're in the middle of, of a different world. And so the racial divide and the prosperity, not just race, but prosperity, it was pretty stark to me when I arrived. That The, the big take away is this is about class race and class and, and sort of desperate the desperation of these kids there and i'm thinking too in terms of you know the racial geography because that's something that i found you know in talking to folks about ferguson in my own writings that number one as your article smartly points out we live in a profoundly race and class segregated society this is an american problem this isn't a ferguson problem i was on ring of fire tv with mike papantonio and i said there are hundreds, if not thousands, of Fergusons all over this country. So the idea that folks are surprised by what had happened here is just stupefying to me. But as you sort of negotiated that racial geography, how do you think, you know, you talk to the black and brown folk of Ferguson, do you think for the white brothers and sisters who live in Ferguson, is it just denial about what's actually happening? Is it sort of this, this cocoon of innocence that people can put around them with race and class? You know, it's a drive-by strip out there. I mean, West Fluorescent Avenue, uh, nail shops and wig shops. I mean, you know, it's this sort of bottom-end retail economy. Take out Chinese. I mean, you're right. This is universal. How we don't see that this is universal in this country requires a certain type of blindness. I didn't talk to many white people, nor did I see many white people in Ferguson. There were some protesters, but they were mostly, you know, young left types. Uh, so I didn't I didn't see many white locals. I did have one woman drive up who told me that she was a local. She drove up at the big media encampment and she said, if this thing would go away, the big media encampment, which was vast, an enormous footprint, both media and, and stormtroopers, the National Guard, dozens of police contingent, different municipalities. So her argument struck me. She said, if this would go away, this media, the media would go away. This whole thing would go away. A Fox News camera jockey told me the same thing. He said, if we leave, this is over. They leave. I think, I think there is a willful blindness. This is hardly a, a representative sample. But I, there's got to be a willful blindness because this is an, a suburban African-American community. Within it, the two apartment complexes in which, uh, you know, where Michael Brown was shot and where his grandmother lived, they are, they are sort of, they're an island of, of low-income housing surrounded by, you know, middle-class black folk who also didn't seem to want too much to do with the demonstration once it really turned ugly. Even those folks that I talked to, they, they were sympathetic, but they, they were not. There was a class divide within that community, too. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about that? I was reading an article, a few folks who've done some great work, as you have, going in there and actually saying this is about race and about class, where they were talking to an African-American, and he said he, they had him there, and they had the young brothers and sisters who were marching, and they were calling him an Uncle Tom for not participating. He basically told them, get out of my neighborhood. Get out of here. You're causing trouble. And then they had an African-American woman, her, her and her husband, and she ran a business. This was right near where the uh, pizza restaurant is. It's gotten a lot of attention with the protesters. And she said a man came to visit her, African-American brother, and basically said, I'm the messenger and you're on the list. And she's like, I have a business to run. I support you. I think what happened here is wrong. 
but I have responsibilities too. So I think you're spot on in terms of the class dynamic, but what were some other experiences that the black and brown middle class shared with, about what happened? Is it they have sympathy and they know this is a problem, but they have other obligations? Is it a difference between generational politics? Uh, generation and class. I was walking off, off of Canfield Drive where the memorial to Michael Brown is the la- last day I was there. And this was, this was pretty much after CNN and, and, and the big media had packed up and gone, and MSNBC. The tents were gone, so it was pretty quiet. And I stopped and talked to this guy, must, must have been in his 50s. He was picking up trash on the street. You know, from his perspective, this has been a huge disruption in his life. And he said, you know, these apartments, and to get into the, here's a fascinating observation. These apartments are an island. To get into them, there's one, there is one street. It intersects with two major streets, but one end of it is blocked off by big, permanently sealed off by big barriers, as if to shut off this insular, poor African-American, almost 100% African-American community. You know, it's, it's one way in. You get to the sign in the middle of that street, just past where Michael Brown was shot, and the sign says, dead end, no outlet. Kind of symbolic. And anyway, this guy was picking up trash, and he pointed to his driveway, and he said, look, see the tracks in my driveway? The traffic is, traffic is coming through here. You know, someone uh, decided they couldn't wait. They drove through my, through, not, not my driveway, they drove across my lawn, destroyed my lawn. There's trash here every night. Interestingly, this guy and, and this guy said, "Me, my kids are both in college. I'm out of here." He was right on the edge of the Canfield Green apartments. Clearly middle class, African American man. But what another thing that struck me, he said, "Look, on the first two nights, I went down to the protests." He said, "When they when, when bullets started flying, I said I'm out of it." And he said, "I haven't been there since. I've been in my house, and my wife and I've been in my house. Thank God, my kids are at college." So there is this class divide within the black community. That's, again, not a representative sample, but it's, it's Vox Populi interview on the sidewalk with this guy. Middle class, big rancher house, nice lawn. He's pissed because this is spilled over into his life. What struck me, though, was initially he was sympathetic. I think the protests themselves really scared a lot of people. Uh, the, burn, the burning down of the quick trip. Uh, that seemed to have been a dividing line when the store when the store burned. And what was it like talking to? Because I know in your story you talked to, I believe, an alderman, and you talked to some other folks. I mean, what was their read? What was their energy like? There was a woman, a one woman who was walking, protesting. Uh, a woman in her sixties. Uh, her name was Audrey Hine. I stopped and talked to her. She had a sign. It was a "Hands Up for Jesus" sign instead of "Hands Up." But she was, she, you know, she was invested in it. And what struck me about her is. This is what white people in this country are blind to. You know, where I live, you don't lay down at traffic stops. You don't get cuffed at traffic stops, you know? You, you, don't, you don't get handcuffs put on you and, and your car searched because the taillight is out. Or it's, you know, so black folks understand what, what's going on there because they're, they're living there. The white community doesn't. You know, I, I talked to one alderman, Anthony Bell, and he was out doing voter registration and it was passive voter registration, which I want to get back in touch with them because I don't think it's that. Well, I know it's not that effective. What is effective is is really aggressive. Three knocks at the door, register. The bus project in Portland, Oregon does this better than anyone else. So but there were a lot of middle class African-Americans. There were a lot of cler- uh, uh, clergy out there also who, who really understood what was going on and who were invest- as invested in this. As, as the kids who were victimized by these cops. That's the heart of the story. I was thinking to the BB, I think it was the Der Spiegel, actually. I mean, again, it's fascinating how you have to look abroad to get real insight into what's going on in our own country. They had a great story about Ferguson where they just basically drove around with these two young African-American men in their 20s or 30s, productive young gentlemen, had not been in jail. I think one had actually gone to college. And they were basically narrating what life in Ferguson is like for a young black man. He said, you cross this street, you know the cops are going to stop you. They're sitting there. It's a speed trap. Between the two of us, we've been stopped almost 20 times. Then they drove around another neighborhood, and they explained how in Ferguson, apparently, they still have these placards outside of homes that, you know, these are historical society placards, basically indicating that a white slave owner lived there, and it was a plantation house, and that the folks are very proud of this fact. And then they drove over another street, and they said, you know, there's another cop who does nothing but harass us all the time. So you get this narrative, as you pointed out, of cumulative harassment and disrespect and anger. And that cup is going to, you know, over overflow at some point. And then, as you smartly pointed out, you have, again, this sort of racial bubble where you have the white Ferguson, it seems, is basically in a debt peonage racket with black Ferguson, arresting these folks, getting money from it. And what reasonable American citizen wouldn't be pissed off beyond belief? 
So did you get any sense of that sort of, as I said, you got the righteous rage and anger, but why would folks have any faith in institutional politics at this point? That's a great question. You know, one, I, I, I interviewed kids. I thought they were the story. By kids, you know, I'm an old guy. I'm talking about young men. I'm talking about men under 30, men in their 20s. You know, everyone had a story. And it was $2.6 million in, in fines. That's, that's the second largest revenue source the city has. That's a piece of the story. But the other piece is 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 what you what you just what you're getting at is that it is you know so the city this this white municipality fifty what fifty three cops fifty of them are white and their salaries are paid for by a black community that they that they constantly harass. I mean, I talked to this one gorgeous young man sitting on his steps in his twenties, you know, good looking kid, doesn't live there anymore. Got, you know, he's got a baseball cap, shorts, T-shirt on. And he, I said, have you ever been stopped? He said, I'm always stopped. Look, I, I was stopped when I lived here. I was working at McDonald's. And he describes his stop. And he says, they, they take me out and they cuff me. He said, I don't smoke pot. I don't have anything in my car. They cuff me. Why am I handcuffed? You know, I don't have any weapons on me. The first thing they say, you got a gun. Uh, then he said, this, he said, I moved away. I drive back here and I'm stopped again. I've got my two-year-old son with me. And, and he said, and, and they do the same act. They do the same. They jack me up just as they did then. My child's crying. I'm outside the car. What really touched me with this guy said, look, I'm not a bad guy. I'm the manager of a Taco Bell. That, that struck me as very poignant. I mean, this guy was on his way to the middle class, yet he was, he was back home in his hometown and he was being mistreated by the same cops who had abused him when he lived there. So this is an accumulation of tens of thousands of indignities. You can't treat people like that and expect them not to blow sometime. And that, that was the big takeaway for me. And Senator Maria nadal Chappelle, her, her profile was elevated by this. I think a lot of people look at her as someone who was, who was looking for camera time. She's a young African-American woman, represents Ferguson. She said that talk to any of these kids. And when they saw Michael Brown, they, you know, this could this could be them. And she said every one of these kids. And, you know, it's it's a community seething with with unfulfilled potential. Kids sitting on porches and unemployment is 17 percent. But youth unemployment must be in the 50s. So you have all these kids and a very limited future. You know, they see their they see one of their one of their neighbors shot down and he lot his body lies on the street for four hours. That don't happen in my neighborhood. You know, if someone gets shot in my neighborhood, they're not gonna be on the street for four hours. Uh he, either in D.C. on Capitol Hill, where I am part-time, or in Austin, Texas, where I am part-time. It just doesn't happen. So I just, I just see this kind of blindness to that. I was thinking about the body of young Michael Brown and the idea of the culture of cruelty. And what would it take to have somebody's body lay there like human debris? And you know, I wrote on ChauncyVega.com. I also had a piece on Alternet. Um, and I did some radio where I said this. And I, and I owned it. I said, this is really a statement about the value of black life in America. Because there's no way that if a black cop had shot a white kid under the same circumstances, that his body would be left in the street in front of the community, because it was really an act of terrorism to intimidate this community. But since you were there, I have to ask the other obvious question, because as I said, I didn't have the resources. I wish I had to go down there. And I'll own it, too. A lot of fear, too, because that is a very volatile and dangerous situation. I was actually on the verge of going, and I spoke to my mother, and she's like, you're my only child. Please don't go down there, because if something were to happen to you, I don't know what I would do. So I will own my deference to my mother's uh, protective impulses for her only child. What were the cops like? Did you actually get an, ex an opportunity to talk? They're running around without their badges on. They're covering up their names. They're acting like a militarized Gestapo. Were they active and present and interfering with you and the community when you were there? Or were, or were they just an ominous presence sort of looming in the shadows? By the time I got there, Ron Johnson had disarmed, not disarmed, but he had changed the tone. But they were there. They were, they were sort of hulking. And they, they were intimidating. They had a hostile attitude toward the press because I think that they thought reporters were telling one side of the story. And, you know, there was for a long time, you know, when, when there's tear gas, and there are assault vehicles with snipers on top of them. There's only one side of the story. I mean, you know, there's no news in a plane landing. The news is the plane crashing. Cops showing up and doing their job in a normal fashion. There's not a big story. Cops showing up driving, uh, you know, military vehicles with military ordnance is a story. They were, I mean, cold and, and aloof. Uh, they, they were just there by the time I got there. 
Now, they insisted on certain protocols, like no one could stop, because stopping meant that people could congregate and cause a problem. So it had to be this walking, this circular walking protest. But there was definitely a hostility, and the cops were white, and the protesters were black. Was there any sort of racial invective being shouted back and forth? Because now we've heard isolated stories about the police and sort of the outsiders using racial epithets and racial slurs. But was it just sort of an unstated confrontation between the powerful and the less powerful? I mean, was was the color line ominous and present just in the visuals? Or was it just, you know, we're cops and we're blue and this race is secondary? Or was race omnipresent in primary? No, well, there, I didn't hear any invective. I, I mean, I saw what I saw a lot of disrespect one thing that Ron Johnson did, the, the uh, state trooper, who, the African-American state trooper who took control of this thing, is he, he moved the Ferguson poli- police a- off the scene. Uh, he, he made them very low profile. You didn't see them. You didn't see their police chief. So that was helpful. There were some cops that were, uh, you know, that were kind of engaging. But for the most, it was, it was an unstated line that divided them and us. You know, there was one moment when this caravan of cars went racing down into the housing projects the one entrance into the Canfield Green Apartments. And they really, you know, it was all these young men. They, they, it looked like, you know, they were yelling. So I went over and talked to the cop and I said, look, there's, there's a big protest down there and these guys are driving into it. And he seemed, he's like, like you're, you're actually helping me? You're telling me this? I said, you know, I said, no, it might be a good idea because these guys look like there's going to be a confrontation down there. And there was. I mean, this, guy, this, this group got out. They were, they were outsiders. And that was a, another part of the problem. There were a lot of people from outside of both races, you know, who were there uh, as, as the antagonists. But the one time I, I went up to a cop and said, look, you might want to look at this. He, he looked at me like I was a Martian. Like, why are you a reporter telling me we're adversaries? And there was an adversary sense, even with the press and reporters. I was thinking, too, you said something really insightful. And this is why I love doing the podcast. All the cool and smart folk who take time to chat with us here on ChaunceyDeVega.com. I just want to back up for one moment very quickly. You were talking about, you know, the idea that the police thought that they weren't being covered fairly and that the coverage is in the plane crash, as you smartly pointed out. As a professional journalist with some years in the business, I was listening to NPR. This was about last summer, two summers ago, and they had a really great interview. And I forget the gentleman's name. He was a journalist slash photographer. And he was recently inducted into one of the professional associations, Halls of Fame, for what he did during the Civil Rights Movement and his coverage of the Civil Rights Movement. He's a white brother, and he said... There was no two sides to the coverage. You either have, you're right or you're wrong. And he said, I'm not going to cover people putting dogs and fire hoses on people with a sympathetic lens. The truth is the truth. How do you think that's changed over the years with the media and this sort of both sides get equal time narrative frame? I've worked for the Texas Observer, which I edited for years, The Spectator. I, you know, I, I've, always been a, I've always had the freedom to report a story as I see it, as, as the, the, this objectivism would require in this case, uh, I, I was watching CNN more than anything else. I, I thought that they covered the story uh, not objectively. I thought that they covered the story as I saw it on the street and not, you know, this kid said this, I've got to find a cop to say this. Mm-hmm. There was a time in, in, at the Dallas Morning News when I was trying to sell a piece to them, it was a labor piece. And, and they said, well, you, you, you've talked to 20 workers, you have to have the same balance on the other side, you have to talk to 20 corporate executives. You know, the story is not about corporate executives. It's about it's about workers, and this story was only about cops as antagonists. The story was about what happened to this young man and how the community responded. So, from my perspective, that was the way it, w- it was to be covered, fairly well covered, except by you know, except by the right wing media. What I read, uh, you know, I read the New York Times. Uh, I was watching CNN, and MSNBC. Fairly sympathetic to the what was happening in the street. And when you think about the principles of journalism, you know, the who, what, why, when, and how that I at some point was told when I was writing for my high school newspaper, do you think that the mainstream corporate media has abandoned those principles in its coverage of Ferguson? Or is this sort of the drive-by 24-7 narrative that we're seeing with Ferguson just a part of a bigger uh, phenomena and that Ferguson isn't being covered any differently than any other crisis of the day or crisis of the week type of story? A Fox News guy said, we are taught to fill the frame. It, so he said, we, made, we might have made this look be- bigger than it is. And we are also attracted to something happening. Not some guy sitting holding a sign, but a confrontation between, conf- confrontation between, between cops and, and kids. And that's part of it. The larger question, I'm not, a good, I'm not a good enough media analyst to know. I think it was re- fairly covered. What happens, though, what strikes me is I stuck around for five days after things kind of wound down, and everyone goes away. These, these protesters have been smart enough 
to keep this story a story by going to St. Louis last week, by continuing to show up. It was an, it was an odd feeling when this huge encampment with 500 vehicles, police and, and media trucks, suddenly is gone. And the story is no more. And the story still is. I mean, the same cops are in place, you know, the same, uh, you know, I saw, I saw Spike Lee at the funeral. I don't know Spike Lee. I went to the funeral. I wanted to, to grab him and pull him aside and say, look, you can, you can fund a, a, an African-American, a representative city council. Someone like you has the means to do this. Uh, and, and I think that if nothing else, this story has, now whether it works or not, this story has, has focused on the absurdity of black community represented by an entirely white uh, city council, almost entirely, and, 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 and policed by an entirely white, except for three police officers. If I can add one more thing, Senator Nadal Chappelle told me, uh, whom I thought was really smart, she was out there, talked to these kids. There was one moment when this young African-American woman, and I was a public school teacher. I taught in inner city schools for many years. You know, there's this woman, and I've, I've seen this face so many times, filled with inconsolable anger, raging about them. And Senator Chappelle reached out, and she put her arms around this kid, and she says, we will take care of each other. I was really touched by that. I mean, I, I'm sold on this woman uh, as, as, as a representative. But she told me something interesting. She said, so why would this community turn out to vote? She said, look, I'm elected. I, I, I'm in office. I look just like them. She said that the president is, looks just like them. Their lives haven't changed. Daily lives, the sort of economic day-to-day lives, the, the circumstances in which they live hadn't changed. So she, she said, so to tell them to go out and vote, you know, the answer is, is what for? I mean, that's, you know, it's a controversial in some circles point of view, but I'm sort of of the mind of Henry, Henry Garreau and others thinking about sort of this culture of cruelty and the rise of inverted totalitarianism, where on one hand we have this deep tradition of civic participation, but we also live in an era where interest groups rule, where the courts are being used to subvert the will of the people, where you have quite literally money-owning democracy. I was thinking about the Koch brothers tape. In another era, one would think that would be a huge story where you have people being recorded talking about buying elections. But again, the media is silent. So on one hand, I want to say, go out there and vote and participate. But on the other hand, if the system is rigged and gamed against you to begin with, perhaps you have to seek out a third way. And it's really, really hard to have this balancing act because... As I said, I was on Ring of Fire Radio, and this was about race and class. And I was talking about Ferguson and young Mr. Michael Brown and what's happening here. But this is also a human rights issue. And it's my deep concern and worry that the mainstream media, the fourth estate that should be watchdogs, yeah, this is about racism and militarized cops. But it's also about human rights and human dignity and empathy. Because what's happening to these poor communities, and I'd love to see an expose, you know, given a suggestion or hint to whoever may be listening to the podcast, I would bet money that similar dynamics are happening in poor rural white America. And on Native and on First Nations reservations as well, in terms of how the police are treating people. But why do you think we're not getting this sort of human rights frame in terms of talking about these horrible events where it's like, hey, these folks are black and brown and they're laying in the street dead. And these militarized cops are coming for you, too, in white suburban America. It's decidedly a human rights story. I agree with you, Chauncey. It's, it is clearly a human rights story. I don't know why we're not getting it. Uh, I mean, when you say there's... When democracy didn't work, there's going to be a third way. In this case, the third way, it was the street, and the street worked. It worked better than anything else. I mean, the, remember, the, the local government is essentially an, instru- an institutional instrument of, right. of quotidian oppression. Right. Every day, you know, there are, there are something like three warrants for every house in, in the city of Ferguson. And almost all of them are African-American. So the courts are an instrument of oppression. I was reporting and I was spending the day with a poet, Claudia Rankin, an African-American woman who teaches in California and is from Brooklyn. She touched on an important point. And the individual dynamic that got out of control and cost this young man his life for, you know, the charge was walking down the middle of the street. Okay, the infraction. The dynamic there was that these white cops believe that if they cut these young black men any slack whatsoever, they're going to lose the control they need to do their job. So part of their job is this, is this professional thuggery because as, sh- as soon as they show any, any sort of weakness and, and, you know, like lower the gun, lower the voice, uh, don't intimidate, then their fear is they're going to lose control 
and they're going to deal with the other, the young, angry black man. So I think that's the dynamic. And that happens from 20 interviews I did with young men. That happens every day in this community. And, and that's the core of it. That and a young man's body lying on a street for four hours. It, it, that, that does not happen in white communities in this country, nor does the sort of occasionally the police, you know, jacking someone up as they do these kids Young men, not kids, every day. And I think that's that's the core of the story. I mean, it makes me think about the great Boston Review article. Um, it came out about a month or so ago about custodial citizenship. And it pointed out, I was talking about stop and first and racial disparities there. But the idea that in places like Ferguson, the citizens are not full citizens. They're harassed. They're, you know, treated and they're treated as second class citizens. You get these warrants and you have the cumulative process where you can't vote. And then if you get these fines, then it escalates and you go to jail. So then you're further marginalizing the polity and can't get a job. And I was thinking, too, in that article, they had a really, really powerful statistic that tells us a lot about race and racial disparities in this country with law enforcement, that black and brown folks are much more likely, who are innocent now, are much more likely to be in contact with the police than white folks who are guilty. And you think about that perverse, it's almost Kafka-esque. The cops are harassing innocent black and brown people, and they're letting criminals who happen to be white go. And we can only imagine, as I said, you know, the new Jim Crow and how this spins out institutionally. Because when the cops come encounter with innocent people like we saw with Michael Brown, bad things can happen. You're increasing the chance of a violent encounter, especially if there isn't that position of mutual respect. But this is a closing comment and observation. So I'm so appreciative of you taking the time to talk about Ferguson. Putting on your the great Kreskin hat, or since you breathe the air, since you talk to folks, what do you think is going to happen? in the next month, two, three, or four, when Darren Wilson inevitably gets off on this? I, well, my crystal ball says when he gets off the community, the community lights up. I, I mean, I can't imagine the city, the, the, you know, with what transpired there, if there is a no bill from that grand jury, and if Attorney General Holder does not come in immediately and, and prosecute with the begin a prosecution for a civil rights violation, which is entirely possible. I, I can't I can't see how that community holds together. And I think it's back to the streets. And if I lived there and I were a young African-American man and witnessed what happened, forget the, the demonstration, saw what happened to someone who looks and acts and lives just like me. And if there were there were not an appropriate response from from the legal, then there's only one. I mean, whether it's manslaughter or homicide, it's there. There are only two. Uh, if there were not appropriate response, response, I think I would take the street. And I think they will. I mean, this sort of simmering anger that's justifiable. And I've watched, you know, the, the daily videos following Twitter, just trying to stay on top of the story. And I think you're spot on that folks are dialing it down a little bit, but they're waiting to see if their government is going to follow through on a just outcome. And, you know, feel free to disagree. As I said, I don't want to throw you the softball leading question there, but. Do you think we're both wrong or right in the sense that Darren Wilson is going to walk based on the way the evidence has been presented, based on the police reports, based on the way that the jury has been constituted? Interestingly enough, the grand jury was already impaneled before he was there. So you couldn't seat another grand jury. So it'd been, it had been up and going for months. Uh, you know, I don't know. I have an occasion. I have occasional moments of faith in the, the workaday American, whether he be white or black, when confronted with, with, with when presented evidence and the evidence here is so stark that I think that there will be at least a manslaughter conviction and I also wonder if some of these jurors say if if I vote to no bill you know am I going to set this town on fire uh, you know I think that there will I think the jury will respond uh, with with uh, with some sort of indictment fingers crossed you know and as a final very quick final question what do you think is of the role of publications like the Washington Spectator and other independent publications outside of the corporate news media is uncovering Ferguson and police brutality more generally and other related issues? You know, we're bottom feeders. We don't have the big readership. However, I, I on occasion see stories, more often than not stories about race, because race is largely uncovered in this country. I see stories that I write sort of percolate through into the mainstream media, and that's very gratifying. Even if you don't get the attribution, when you see all of your sources interviewed, and a story that runs at a, at a larger news outlet, you know, you've done your job. And I think that's that's our function is not to go tell a fair and balanced story, but go out and talk to people and get the story as they see it in this case uh, or environmental stories. And, and then hope that hope that something uh, it's like sort of like serving uh, tennis balls into the surf and, and said maybe it's, there's someone out there to catch one in the, uh, once in a while. 
I mean, it's so good to hear folks in the fourth estate actually following through on their responsibilities to tell the truth and to be a check on power. I just want to thank you again for taking your time to talk with the listeners and readers of We Are Respectful Negroes, a podcast here on com about your experiences in Ferguson. And again, I am so appreciative, and I think that folks need to hear your voice and those of others in the independent media who are willing to engage in truth-telling on these very difficult and important matters. But again, I just want to thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity, and it's always good to be to, to participate in a, in a smart interview, so thanks. I just want to thank Lou Du Bois one more time for being so gracious to sit down and chat with us about his experiences in Ferguson. As I said, you know, I have so much respect for the old-fashioned traditional journalists who actually go get their feet on the ground, talk to people, and try to give us, those of us who are outside, you know, who have not been in Ferguson, who know that there is more to the story than the drive-by media I will depict. I actually want to give a movie recommendation in the context of my observation about Lou Du Bois's great comments. There's a new movie out called Nightcrawler. It's basically about stringers. These are the folks who get the videos um, in Los Angeles. And I mean, the movie should be nominated for an Oscar. It has this sort of, it has sort of a Cronenberg feel to it as it indicts the media. There's a lot going on. As I said, I don't want to give it all away, but certainly see the film. But there's a really powerful moment in the film where the main character goes and basically tries to sell his videotape. And one of the news editors says, think about the evening news as a woman, a white woman running down the street with her hair on fire being chased by somebody with a knife. Even more so, they're even more transparent about if it bleeds, it leads. But especially if it's a white person who's rich, who's been hurt, who's been violated, who's been robbed, who's been raped by a black or brown person. I mean, what a succinct example of what we know about the intersection of race, crime, the media, and the news. And thinking back about Ferguson, as I said, Ferguson is going to explode. Um, It's no way that it cannot at this point. I hope it doesn't, but people have righteous anger. They've been denied. Darren Wilson's going to walk. And as Lou Du Bois pointed out in his conversations with some of the young brothers there, what we're seeing in Ferguson, those are the sum results of hundreds, thousands, many dozens of grievances over time. A police department that is not representative, a police department that views the community as the enemy. They operate as though they're in Iraq or Afghanistan fighting a counterinsurgency battle. And then when the media, going back to if it bleeds, it leads, especially if it's black or brown, there's white folk who are perceived as being victims. Two obvious narratives are going to come out when Darren Wilson walks and the young brothers and sisters and others righteously channel their rage and anger at a criminal injustice system. Media narrative one, look at these black people who don't know how to behave. That's an old one. They're rioting. They don't respect the rule of law and authority, especially you're going to hear that on Fox News. Media narrative number two, they're going to generalize from that behavior to talk about, quote, unquote, black leaders at large. How come black leadership? How come they can't control these young people, these thugs, these criminals? Darren Wilson is a victim. And, and pay attention to that because that's going to be the narrative. The white right, the white victimologists online, the white supremacists, to the degree they can even be decoupled from one another, they're already playing that narrative about Darren Wilson, the noble victim. And the subcategory of that narrative in terms of the media framing will be, woe is me. How will Darren Wilson reconstruct his life? How will he be able to move on? His good name has been slurred and dragged through the mud. What is Darren Wilson to do? How is he to survive? And that's going to be the dominant media narrative, either this week or next or in the next few weeks when the grand jury decision comes out, the no bill for Darren Wilson. So folks, be ready. And there's a lot of great resources. You know, I can't help but make book suggestions. Uh, There are lots of research out there about race in the media. Also, and we talked about this on ChelseaVega.com, about how police decide who's quote-unquote suspicious. We know race is part of that. We've also talked about the concept known as custodial citizenship, basically how black and brown folks are treated as second-class citizens and how the legal system is part of that with how the new Jim and Jane Crow prison industrial complex goes and snares people in its traps, marginalizes them, and we see discrimination from the very bottom, number one, who the cops decide to harass and arrest all the way up to the top in terms of how judges and prosecutors decide whether to proceed or not when looking at sentence and disparity. There's actually a really excellent resource. It's called Critical Race Realism, Intersections of Psychology, Race, and the Law. And the editors are Gregory S. Parks, Shane Jones, and W. Jonathan Carty. And it's a wonderful collection of legal scholarship, very accessible, which is the heart of critical race theory. Make Taking the law, taking that scholarship, using storytelling, talking in a direct way to make it accessible to a general and interested readership. And they have wonderful selections, everything from jury selection to how police decide who to arrest or not, sentencing disparities. And I just hope that when the inevitable happens, that the 24-7 media goes beyond the normal folks, the talking heads that they have on, and doesn't treat 
the outcome in terms of Darren Wilson's inevitable being freed, inevitable being further freed, I'll qualify that, with his pension, with his money, he's being paid right now as he sits home, that they provide some context. And they don't treat racism and white supremacy and these disparate outcomes and what I've called repeatedly this black necropolis of unarmed black and brown youth killed by the police in very suspicious circumstances, whether they were cosplaying and walking down the street and shot in the back, young black men with handcuffs who have a Harry Houdini moment and somehow get out of the handcuffs and kill themselves with a cop's pistol in the police car, to these recent, I mean, hellish, if you want to become very Orwellian, very disturbed, recent decision where the cops basically have gone to the courts and said, we have the constitutional right to violate people and their freedoms and to commit acts of police brutality. I mean, this is something out of 1984 or even worse. I mean, I wonder what Hannah Arendt and others would say about this moment of the surveillance society and police brutality and police authoritarianism against the American people at large, but also black and brown people in particular. So our next episode, episode three here, season three of the Chauncey Vegas show, we sit down, as I said, and talk to Pastor Renita Lampkin. And we got Ludo Boyce as part one, which, as I said, I just want to thank him one more time for being so generous with his energy and his sharing about his experiences in Ferguson. And then we got part two, that one-two punch. Pastor Lampkin, Sister Renita, does a lot of truth-telling about what she expects to happen with the inevitable no bill for Darren Wilson, her experiences reaching out and talking and working with young black and brown youth in Ferguson, her insights and experiences, again, being on the front lines, being someone who was shot by the Ferguson police and their riot against the people of Ferguson as they sought to defend their brother and ally in police brutality, Mr. Darren Wilson. And as I've said on ChaunceyDebate.com and also a recent conversation with the wonderful Janice Graham of the blog talk radio show Our Common Grounds, just think about this. The police and the state have spent millions, tens of millions, I don't know, to defend Darren Wilson, to protect one person under highly suspicious circumstances who killed an unarmed black teenager in the street whose body was left there for hours. Think about all that money they spent and the symbolism of that and whose lives have value and whose lives do not. And this is not... As Darren Wilson's defenders would say, you go on Twitter, they have all these people, white supremacists and others, defending Darren Wilson. And some of them are just defending Darren Wilson because of his homicidal ideation. They actually want to have lived through Darren Wilson and have shot and killed a young black person. There's a very, very deep intersection here about hero worship of someone who's committed a dastardly deed. Or at the very least, committed a deed that should not be praised. Because again, all we're asking for is a trial. All we're asking for is that there is accountability. And then let the chips fall where they may with the caveat being we know about racism and classism in the criminal justice system, and especially in how juries and judges make decisions. So I want to thank you all again for listening to The Chauncey de Vega Show. You can find us on chaunceydevega.com. You can find us on the new YouTube channel. And as I always say, and as I say at the end of every podcast, no advertising on The Chauncey de Vega Show. Don't accept it. I don't want to have to be censored. I've had offers. No advertising on the website. Again, I've had offers, and I say, no, I want to feel free to speak truth to power in the way I feel is most appropriate. But that doesn't mean... The opportunity costs aren't real. So if you are so inclined, if you enjoy the resources we offer here on the Chauncey de Vegas show, the interesting conversations with some really smart and intelligent folks for season three, I mean, I'm so flattered by how many people have said, yes, we would be honored to be on the Chauncey de Vegas show. Just tell us when and how, and we'll sit down and chat. If you like those conversations, and if you are so able, there's the PayPal link on the right-hand sidebar of chaunceydevega.com. Throw some ducats into that collection pile. Keep things moving forward and send some positive energy. And if you can, share, download, tweet. Talk about what we've got going on here on the Chauncey Vegas Show and the interesting, smart folks and the, I think, really great conversations we've been able to have as we sit down at the virtual bar. Thank you once more. Thank you for listening. Until next time, be safe and be well.